This is podcast number 24 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to look at the Iroquois Confederation. Because this podcast series focuses on the English colonies in North America, which later became the United States, I haven't said a lot about the Indian nations that interacted with the colonies. This leaves the impression that the Indians weren't that big of a factor in colonial development. The fact is, the Indians played an important role in the economic, political, military, and cultural development of the colonies. This specific podcast focuses on the Iroquois Confederation, which was arguably the most powerful Indian nation that the colonists had to deal with. Long before Europeans came to North America, the Indian nations had long engaged in wars of conquest against each other and in taking each other's land. We'll see plenty of this with the Iroquois, who could be every bit as self-serving and avaricious as the European colonizers were. In modern terms, the Iroquois Confederation occupied western and northern New York State. It was composed of five, later six, closely related Indian nations. At the west end of Iroquois was the largest of the Iroquois nations, the Seneca. They lived on the south side of Lake Ontario. Just to the east of the Seneca were the Cayugas. Just to the east of the Cayugas were the Onondagas, whose leading town served as the capital of the Confederation. To the east of the Onondagas were the Oneidas, and to the east of the Oneidas were the famous Mohawks, who lived on the Mohawk River and northwards towards Lake Champlain. Colonists often referred to the Iroquois Confederation as the Five Nations, later the Sixth Nation, the Tuscarora, joined the Confederation in 1722. The geographic location of the Iroquois put them in between the French in Canada and the English in New England and New York. It also put them in an ideal location to control trade, not only with Europeans, but with neighboring Indian nations who were often dominated by the Iroquois. Iroquois folklore tells of a time when the nations of the Iroquois Confederation were not united and were constantly at war with each other. There are many different versions of this story, but they all seem to include a certain man whose name I'm certain I won't pronounce properly, but here goes. His name is Deganawida. This man had a message of peace. He was trying to end the war and all the devastation that it caused among the Indians. He encountered a, a young Mohawk leader named Hiawatha, who was tortured with mourning and sadness for the destruction and the loss of his family in these wars. Hiawatha was converted to Deganawida's message of peace, and he himself began preaching the message of peace with Deganawida throughout the various nations that would later become the Iroquois Confederation. This message of peace spread throughout the five nations that they soon decided to lay down arms, and they formed the great confederation called the Great League of Peace and Power, and which we call the Iroquois Confederation. The peace in that title refers to the fact that the nations of the Iroquois Confederation would generally have peace among themselves. But the second word, power, has to do with the fact that as a united confederation, they would now be able to exert their power and conquer neighboring Indian tribes and put many of them under tribute, which they did. The Iroquois Confederation was presided over by a grand council, which consisted of 50 chiefs, 10 from each of the Indian nations that comprised the confederation. While the Grand Council had tremendous influence over general policy, their decisions weren't binding, and very often the different nations that made up the Confederacy were at odds with each other in how to proceed. For example, the Senecas, which were at the west end of the Confederation, they usually sided with the French more, while at the east side of the Confederation were the Mohawks. They tended to side first with the Dutch and later with the English. The nations of the Iroquois Confederation were subdivided into clans. The clans were named after various animals, such as the turtle clan, the bear clan, the wolf clan, etc. In Iroquois society, lineage was matrilineal. That meant that you traced your lineage through your mother. This put the women in a position of importance as the leaders of the various clans, and it was the women who nominated the male chiefs. The Iroquois lived in houses constructed of tree branches and bark. They were often called longhouses because as the family increased or the size of the family, they would make additions to one end or the other. Sometimes these longhouses became as long as 100 feet. Inside the longhouses were compartments where different family members lived and also different supplies could be stowed away. About every 10 to 20 years, the Iroquois had to abandon their longhouses and their locations in order to rebuild somewhere else because their longhouses would become infested with vermin and uh, bugs and things. The division of labor between men and women was pretty much standard for what you would think of in most societies at that time. 
The men formed the raiding and hunting parties. They also led the confederation and its various nations. And the women tended the fields and grew the corn and pretty much ran the villages and towns which they lived in. Sometimes the women accompanied men on their raiding and hunting parties. The diet of the Iroquois consisted of corn, beans, and squash, which they either made soups out of or made into bread. They also ate pumpkins and maple sugar. In addition to the game that the men brought back into the village to eat, the Iroquois were also cannibals, which meant that they ate human flesh on occasion. We'll talk more about that later. On special occasions, the Iroquois feasted on bear meat. They would have bear feasts. An important article that Iroquois made were belts made out of little seashell beads and other things called wampum. Wampum was also used as a form of money on some occasions, and it was probably most important because it was always present at any important decisions or treaties that were made. In this way, wampum formed kind of a record-keeping function in that it was used to commemorate certain events or important events or treaties. They could go dig out that belt of wampum, and that would remind them of the treaty that was made or where an important decision was reached by the council. Participation in war was an important step in the development of young men. All was seen as part of the rite of passage for young men. As so many young men wished to participate in war, it created a dynamic in which the Iroquois nation probably no matter how much it wanted to be at peace, would always have a certain amount of conflict with its neighboring Indian tribes. To the Iroquois, the physical world around them was alive with spiritual powers. One man, named Conrad Weiser, who was traveling with a group of Iroquois, relates the following story that illustrates this point. It began to rain during the evening, and several of the Iroquois wanted to set up a hut to get out of the rain. But the ground was stony, and they weren't able to dig very far, so that one of the Iroquois began to talk to the stones, both encouraging them to get out of his way as well as threatening them that he would dig them out of the ground and throw them in the fire. One of the other men in the group began to laugh at the Indian, and the Indian said back to him, You see that I am beating, for the stones are giving way on one side. We poor Indians cannot use iron instruments like you Europeans, but we have other means which we have learned from our grandfathers, and we have it much easier if we talk to the spirits and call them friends and mingle threats therewith when we succeed. Weiser also relates how the Iroquois had what he called sorcerers, or whom we might call shaman or medicine men today. He said, These sorcerers are very well paid for their advice, which they give when desired. A small round hut about four feet wide is built for them, and covered with hides or skins or carpets. Then a quantity of hot stones is carried into the hut, and they go within as if they wish to sweat, and begin to sing and talk to their familiar spirits, until they seem to be drunken or swooning on account of the heat. Occasionally they ask for a little water to cool themselves. In the meantime, a whole house full of Indians sit around the hut quite devoutly, some calling out to him, O grandfather, O father, O brother, hold out, cheer up, until thou hast entreated and moved thy familiar spirit. And this they do until a crow or a fox or a wolf or any other wild animal comes to him in the hut and brings him the desired answer. The sorcerer or conjurer says nothing until he comes out of the hut, and then such an answer passes for an oracle, or divinely true answer. Weiser also mentions that many of these sorcerers, after having gone through the sweat lodge ritual to get answers for people that were paying them, were killed for giving wrong answers. So I guess you had to be careful if you were going to do that whole routine in a sweat lodge. Tobacco was an important part of Iroquois spirituality. They often made offerings of it to the spirits to keep them happy and what they thought would protect them. The Iroquois felt that smoking tobacco was as much a religious act as anything else, for it pleased the spirits and the smoke also imbued the spirit of the tobacco into the person smoking it. When liquor was first introduced among the Indians by the Europeans, they moved forward the same thinking regarding the effects of inebriation. So if a drunken Iroquois killed someone, they blamed the liquor for it rather than the person. This was very much different, of course, than European thinking, which was if you became inebriated and committed a crime, you had assumed the risk by allowing yourself to become inebriated. There's a great cultural difference between the Iroquois and the Europeans. From their youth, Iroquois boys were taught the art of war so that they could one day become warriors. Traditionally, when going into combat, they wore wooden armor, which quickly became obsolete once firearms were introduced among the Indians. One of the most important aspects of Iroquois society was how they dealt with the grief of losing a loved one. It was thought that a person in mourning could lose their reason, as the fabled Hiawatha had done. The mourning process involved engaging in a mourning war. The purpose of the Morning War was to capture people who could then be adopted into the Iroquois families to replace those who had died due to war or disease or other causes. Here's the important concept. Traditional Iroquois warfare focused on capturing captives. The Iroquois believed that warriors who died in combat were excluded from their families 
and were doomed to wander the forest seeking revenge, it's easy to see how one morning war could spawn another one. The Iroquois also engaged in war with other Indian nations for other reasons too. They engaged in empire building, and after the trade with the Europeans was established, they engaged in wars for economic reasons in an effort to dominate the fur trade. The Iroquois Confederation was a formidable military power which could put hundreds of warriors in the field at any given time. Iroquois raiding parties could move quickly over vast tracts of forest in almost near silence, and they were capable of conducting raids hundreds of miles from their homeland. Much about their military operations resembled hunting. The Indians in general were excellent scouts and were very adept at ambushing enemies. This is in sharp contrast to European military-style operations. European armies enjoyed a tremendous advantage in firepower, in steel weapons, and in having mounted troops, but their creaky supply wagons and artillery carriages made it impossible for them to travel through the woods quickly or unnoticed, and mounted troops aren't nearly so effective in heavily forested or rough terrain. Because Iroquois warriors focused on capturing captives while avoiding death in combat, many Europeans considered them to be cowards who skulked in the woods while avoiding direct combat. To summarize, European warfare focused on destroying an enemy in order to achieve victory through submission, while the Iroquois focused on avoiding direct combat and capturing captives. Because so many captives were adopted into Iroquois villages, one French Jesuit commented that probably not more than 20% of the Iroquois were of pure blood. Children who were captured could expect to be adopted by Iroquois family and trained to become full-fledged Iroquois someday. Women who were captured by Iroquois, especially women of childbearing age, could expect to be adopted in, and they were particularly valued because they could help replenish any lost people that the Iroquois had lost due to war or disease. Warriors who were captured by the Iroquois could expect some different treatment. Some of them might be adopted into Iroquois families after a roughing up. Many of the others faced a horrible ritualistic torture procedure that could sometimes last several days. These tortures included the victim being tied to a pole on top of a scaffold. The tortures included burnings with hot knives or hatchets that had been held in the fire for a while, burning different areas of the body, or ripping out fingernails or cutting off body parts. This torture process was designed to allow the captive warrior a chance to prove their strength and bravery. Any family members of the tortured warrior who were also captured were forced to watch and were expected to show their bravery and courage as well by not shrieking or yelling or showing any emotion. Once a torture victim had died or been killed during the torture process, they were often dismembered and their body parts were thrown into the stew or eaten in raw fashion. If a torture victim had held up well under the torture and hadn't let out too many shrinks or shown too many signs of fear or agony, Iroquois warriors thought it might be good to eat his heart or drink his blood, hoping they would gain the strength or the ability that he had had to withhold his pain during the torture process. It's impossible to overstate just how different the Indians were from the Europeans. Their cultures were totally different. They both saw the world around them very differently. They both had very differing ideas of what was important and what was not. To illustrate this last point, Benjamin Franklin tells of a story in which several Iroquois leaders met with some Virginia officials, and the Virginia officials offered to allow some of the Iroquois young men to come and attend their college in Virginia. It was the custom of the Iroquois not to give an answer to a question on the same day it was asked, but to wait overnight and to give their answer the next day, which they did. Franklin tells of the answer that the Iroquois leaders gave to the Virginia leaders in these words. They said, We are convinced, therefore, that you mean to do us good by your proposal, and we thank you heartily. But you who are wise must know that different nations have different conceptions of things. You will therefore not take it amiss if our ideas of this kind of education happen not to be the same with yours. We have had some experience of it. Several of our young people were formerly brought up at the colleges of the northern provinces. They were instructed in all of your sciences, but when they came back to us, they were bad runners, ignorant of every means of living in the woods, unable to bear either cold or hunger, knew neither how to build a cabin, take a deer, or kill an enemy, spoke our language imperfectly, were therefore neither fit for hunters, warriors, or counselors. They were totally good for nothing. The first recorded contact between Iroquois and Europeans occurred in the 1500s, just a few decades after Columbus's voyages, when French explorers were exploring the St. Lawrence River. After establishing colonies in the St. Lawrence River, and today's what is Canada, the French made the strategic decision to ally themselves with the Huron Indians and the other Indians of the Great Lakes region, 
all of whom were traditional enemies of the Iroquois. For this reason, the French and Iroquois were on a hostile footing from really from the very beginning. During the 1600s, the French and their Indian allies and the Iroquois engaged in a series of wars popularly known today as the Beaver Wars. During the initial stages of these wars, the Iroquois had the advantage. Their raids against French settlements were so devastating that they almost brought the French Canadians to their knees. Likewise, Iroquois raids against the Hurons, who were the allies of the French, were so devastating that they left some areas depopulated and brought back many people to be adopted into the Iroquois villages and families. Over time, however, the French were able to regroup and they conducted several very destructive campaigns deep into the Iroquois country, which left the Iroquois exhausted and unable almost to continue the war. The Dutch had set up a trading post in what is today upstate New York as part of the bigger colony of the New Netherlands. The English later took over the Dutch colonies and renamed this trading post Albany, which is the name it still bears today. Albany remained the main trading depot between the Iroquois, especially the Mohawk, and the English throughout the colonial period. As a result, the Iroquois were nominally allied with the English, but it was often more of a trading alliance than a military one. During the Beaver Wars, both the Dutch and later the English were happy to supply the Iroquois in order to keep pressure on the French in Canada. The Beaver Wars, however, left the Iroquois exhausted, and in fact, they even attempted to deed over land that they had conquered from other Indians to the English in exchange for protection, which the English didn't accept. I think during this time, Iroquois power waned a little bit, and some of the surrounding tribes that the Iroquois had dominated and demanded tribute from were kind of rebelling against it. There's a story about a Mohawk, Iroquois Mohawk party that was attempting to collect tribute from a neighboring tribe. The neighboring tribe set up an ambush, killed all the Mohawk that were coming there to collect the tribute, except for one man. And this man, they partially scalped and cut off his upper lip and sent him back to the Iroquois, which was kind of their way of saying how they felt about having to pay tribute to them. A few years earlier before this, when the Iroquois was, were in a position of power, I doubt that this would have been attempted. Even though the Beaver Wars had weakened the Iroquois, the English still regarded the Iroquois as the key to dealing with the French. Lord Bellamont, the governor of New York, wrote this letter back to the English Board of Trade, saying, All their security is bound up in the preservation of the Iroquois in amity with us, and trying to secure and retrieve the eastern Indians, that you may set the French at defiance and laugh at all their projects to circumvent us, their settlements at Mississippi and Canada and Nova Scotia put together. In fact, the Iroquois were considered such an important buffer with the French that Queen Anne actually held an audience with representatives of the Iroquois nation in 1710. By about 1700, the Iroquois decided that the best thing that they could do was to take a neutral course. Being sandwiched between the French and English was not a good place to be, and they weren't certain that they would survive another colonial war. They knew that both the French and English needed their assistance against each other, so they decided to play them off against each other and be neutral. In an effort to keep the Iroquois allies, or at least not let them go over to the French, the English lavished hundreds of pounds worth of gifts upon them. So playing the French and the English off against each other was very lucrative for the Iroquois. And with the wars with France over, Iroquois decided upon a series of military campaigns against other Indian nations to the south. Some of these raids went as far south as Georgia. As I mentioned before, the Iroquois were very adept at long-range raids. In former raids, they had raided as far as the Mississippi River and against Indians as far south as the Ohio country and even into Kentucky and Tennessee. These raids were encouraged by the French, and they strained relations with the colonial governments in the southern English colonies because many of the Iroquois raids were against Indians that were allied with the colonial southern colonies. Colonial governors in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and other southern colonies complained about Iroquois parties stealing slaves, looting backcountry farms, and raids against Indian allies that they were allied to. In some cases, Iroquois actually stole African slaves and were selling them to make money. In order to increase the instability in the English colonial backcountry, the French sent their western Indian allies alongside the Iroquois to help them. While many Indian tribes were attacked by the Iroquois, these raids fell particularly hard upon the Catawbas and Choctaw and Cherokee Indians, whom the Iroquois derisively called flatheads. English colonial officials tried to intervene and stop the wars, but there seems to have been a, a particular vindictiveness that the Iroquois felt towards the flatheads. In response to one of these efforts to stop it by a colonial governor, one Iroquois chief said, 
When I think of the brave warriors that have been slain by the flatheads, I can govern myself no longer. I reject your belt, meaning the governor's request that they not attack the flatheads, for the hatred I bear to the flatheads can never be forgotten. To add insult to injury, some of the lands that these Iroquois had stolen from the other Indians, they attempted to sell to British authorities to make money. There are amusing stories of Iroquois warriors who have participated in these southern campaigns that when they returned home, they actually tattooed pictures of alligators on their bodies from the alligators they had seen down south. I thought that was kind of funny. During the 1750s and early 1760s, the French and English engaged in what was the last colonial war, commonly called the French and Indian War. The English won this war and expelled the French and took over Canada. With the French no longer present, Iroquois could no longer play the British and French off against each other. This meant that the British were not so interested in courting their favor anymore. As a general rule, it was usually true that after the first contact between Indians and Europeans, that Indians usually became dependent upon the Europeans for the things they wanted and couldn't make. Indians wanted guns, firearms, they wanted metal objects, they wanted cloth, and they wanted liquor too. In exchange, they could give fur, sometimes they gave slaves, and they could also offer their assistance as allies, which is what the Iroquois had done. But like the other Indian nations, the Iroquois had become dependent upon the Europeans for what they wanted and needed most. By this time, they were living in European-style log huts. Many of them were doing European-style work. They were wearing cloth instead of furs and leather skins. And the ravages of rum and liquor were taking a toll upon their population as well. The colonies had grown quite a bit too. Colonies were now powerful enough that they had enough militia they could probably defend themselves. And without the French menace around, the British didn't feel so much need for the Iroquois as allies. The Iroquois complained bitterly about British colonists expanding westward into their lands, which seems to me to be a little bit of a hollow complaint since the Iroquois themselves had stolen so much land from other Indians and sold it to the British. In fact, at the Treaty of Stanwix, the Iroquois made a fortune selling lands they had taken from the Shawnee and the Delaware Indians. In order to try and stop conflicts between his colonists and Indian allies, not just the Iroquois, but other Indians all throughout the colonies, the king issued a proclamation in 1763, which effectively drew a line that the colonists were not supposed to go westward of. And of course, they promptly ignored this line and continued to migrate westward, feeling it was their right to get land that was vacant. The coming of the American Revolution with its War of Independence against Britain came shortly after the French and Indian War, and it tore the Iroquois Confederation apart. Some of the Iroquois sided with the Americans, but most sided with the British. As hostilities between the colonists and the mother country began, a colonel, a British colonel named Henry Hamilton, who was commandant at Fort Detroit, was given orders to begin working with the Indians to start raids on the back country. Sometimes Henry Hamilton was known as the hair buyer because he was known to have paid bounties for scalps, which was not uncommon back then. He wasn't the only one doing that. So Hamilton, with gifts as well as the animosity he knew that many of the Iroquois had towards American uh, westward colonists, incited them to raid settlements in backstate Pennsylvania and New York, which often turned into massacres. In fact, these raids were so outrageous to the Americans that they actually complained about them as one of their complaints against the king in the Declaration of Independence. They wrote, He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, meaning the king, and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. American leaders responded harshly to these Iroquois raids. General Sullivan, under orders from General Washington in the summer of 1779, led a campaign of continental soldiers and militia to the backstate New York area around the Finger Lakes district. His campaign took him around the uh, lakes of Cayuga and western New York. On a map today, they look like long, skinny lakes. That's why they're called Finger Lakes. And just a few miles south of a famous landmark known as the Hill Camorra. His mission or job in this campaign was to try and destroy Indian settlements, or Iroquois settlements. He destroyed crops, orchards, cornfields, houses, buildings, anything that would support life among the Iroquois. The object of the campaign was to drive them basically out of the country, and that's exactly what happened. The Iroquois could no longer support themselves after this campaign, and they all migrated to Canada so that the British could take care of them. It shows, too, just how weak they had become. They no longer were able to resist campaigns led by Western armies. 
This campaign was destructive from but a military perspective, it was certainly necessary in order to secure the frontiers of western Pennsylvania and New York. There's also the historical angle. Had the Iroquois not been driven out of western New York after the war, assuming the Americans had gained their independence, the British certainly would have demanded that western New York be part of Canada since their allies, the Iroquois, were living there. That would mean that the map of the United States would be quite a bit different today than it looks. In modern times, I've often heard commentators speculate that the Iroquois had an important influence upon the United States Constitution, or that the Founding Fathers looked at them and their model of the Confederation and used that as a model for the Constitution. Ben Franklin, who was curious about their Confederation, and Ben Franklin being the great man he was, he was curious about everything, made comments about their Confederation. But other than this, I can't find much of any evidence, in fact, very little evidence that they use the Iroquois Confederation as a model for any part of the American government, either before or after the Constitution was ratified. And finally, I'll end with this interesting question, something I've wondered about. What would the northeastern United States be like today had the Iroquois not existed? And of course, with every historical question, there's a thousand contingencies that can change an answer. But I think one thing that's certainly true would be that had the Iroquois Confederation not been there or had it been, had Western New York been occupied by perhaps a weaker Indian nation, I think the French would have been more aggressive at colonizing. They wouldn't have been set back so early as they were by those devastating Iroquois raids. And perhaps they may still have been there today because they might have been strong enough to resist the British who drove them out during the French and Indian War. For further reading about the subject of the Iroquois, I recommend the following books and articles. The Edge of the Woods, Iroquois, 1534-1701 by John Parmenter. The Ordeal of the Longhouse, The Peoples of the Iroquois League in the Era of European Colonization by Daniel K. Richter. Masters of Empire, Great Lakes Indians and the Making of America by Michael A. McDonnell. Atlas of the North American Indian by Carl Waldman. The Iroquois in the American Revolution by Barbara Graymont. The War That Made America, A Short History of the French and Indian War by Fred Anderson. Benjamin Franklin, Autobiography, Poor Richard and Later Writings, edited by J.A. Leo LeMay. Connecticut Unscathed, Victory in the Great Narragansett War, 1675-1676 by Jason W. Warren. After the Morning Wars, the Iroquois Allies in Colonial North American Campaigns, 1676-1760, by John Parmenter, published in the William & Mary Quarterly, 3rd Series, Volume 64, Number 1, January 2007. The Five Nations and Queen Anne, by William Thomas Morgan, published in the Mississippi Valley Historical Review, Volume 13, Number 2, September 1926. Down the Warrior's Path, the Causes of the Southern Wars of the Iroquois by Richard Aquila, published in the American Indian Quarterly, Volume 4, Number 3, August 1978. The Divided Ground, Upper Canada, New York, and the Iroquois Six Nations, 1783-1815 by Alan Taylor, published in the Journal of the Early Republic, Volume 22, Number 1, Spring 2002. Sir William Johnson, Interpreter of the Iroquois, by Milton W. Hamilton and William Johnson, published in Ethnohistory, Volume 10, Number 3, Summer, 1963. War and Culture, The Iroquois Experience, by Daniel Richter, published in the William and Mary Quarterly, Volume 40, Number 4, October, 1983. Cultural Brokers and Intercultural Politics, New York, Iroquois Relations, 1664-1701, by Daniel K. Richter, Published in the Journal of American History, Volume 75, Number 1, June 1988. Notes on the Iroquois and Delaware Indians. Communications from Conrad Weiser to Christopher Sauer, 1746-1749. Published in three parts in the Pennsylvania Magazine of History and Biography, Volume 1, Number 2, 1877, Volume 1, Number 3, 1877, and Volume 2, Number 4, 1878, and Iroquois Women by W. M. Beecham, published in the Journal of American Folklore, Volume 13, Number 49, April through June 1900.